Coming up on this episode of The Social Hour, Pinterest will stop stalking you if you decide you want it to. Plus, what's up with Google's secret helpouts project? What does it all mean? The self-control app is good if there are websites you just can't stop going to, and how brands are getting kind of sneaky on Instagram video and Instagram saying, no way. All that and more next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth provided by the new Winamp for Android, featuring wireless sync and one-click iTunes import. Now with free daily music downloads and full-length CD listening parties. Download it for free at winamp.com slash android. Bandwidth for the Social Hour is brought to you by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is The Social Hour, episode 121, recorded Friday, July 26th, 2013. This episode of The Social Hour is brought to you by Warby Parker Eyewear. Get boutique quality, classically crafted eyewear at revolutionary prices. For a free home try-on of five stylish frames of your choice, go to warbyparker.com. After trying out the frames at home, get special expedited delivery on your purchase by using the code SOCIALHOUR. And by Social Media Solutions from SAP. If you're a social media manager at a large enterprise, gain insight and engage in social media with Social Media Solutions from SAP to improve your customer service and support experience. Take a guided tour today at sap.com slash twit. And by 99designs, the world's largest graphic design marketplace. 99designs connects businesses seeking quality, affordable designs with a community of more than 225,000 graphic designers. Visit 99designs.com slash social hour to receive a free power pack upgrade valued at $99. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another fun-filled, fantabulous episode of The Social Hour from TWIT World Headquarters in Petaluma, California, where we have been for two solid years now. I'm Sarah Lane, and normally I'd be joined by Amber MacArthur in either Toronto, Ontario, or sometimes she's at her office in lovely Florida, but today she's actually en route to Prince Edward Island, her island of origin, actually, and so she couldn't make it on the show, so I, as Actar my co-host on Tech News Today and also the host of... Know How. Know How here on the Twit Network has graciously offered to sit in for Amber. And I'm also at, at, at Twit's world headquarters in Petaluma. Just You're over. right next to me, it's which a different is unusual. Spot. Yeah, I know. I could check in. I think this is a different spot on Foursquare. I'm not sure about there. Got a fruit fly on the set, too. Well, wants yeah, to be that's on what happens. I, I bring the fruit flies. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, man. I have fans. Uh, <laughs> or maybe my, my little ah, protein geez. drink is open. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. You know, we had a really bad fly problem when we first moved to the studio, which was really was almost exactly two years ago uh, when we, uh, I guess we were doing the show before we moved to the, I don't know. No, I don't. That was like a long time. We've all time. been here so long. I don't, I don't remember when anything started or ended. In, or, internet time, that was like 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. Two years ago. So, I mean. I feel like I haven't seen a fly in here for a solid doesn't year. Doesn't it bring you back? Makes yeah. you feel like the very beginning. Those are the early days, yeah, yeah, where we didn't know what to do with all of our fruit. So, of course, this is a show where we spend, give or take, about an hour talking about uh, some of the top stories of the week that pertain to everybody's favorite social networks or maybe even social networks that you've never heard of or interesting stories about what's happening in the world of social networking and all of us who use them daily. I guess we'll start with some pretty positive news for one of the biggest social networks in the world, if not the biggest, uh, certainly the biggest as far as number share, and that is Facebook. Facebook uh, had some pretty strong revenue this last quarter, had its quarterly earnings. Quite a few companies did this week as well. Apple was another one, but Facebook being the social network that it is, had some great revenue. We could go over the numbers, but the numbers aren't really all that interesting in themselves. What is interesting is that Mark Zuckerberg says that you know our community is growing, our engagement is deepening, and because of the success that we've made in m our mobile applications, uh, and particularly advertising to people within those mobile applications, revenue is up, which is exactly what Facebook has needed for a long time now. Yeah, it's crazy though. When, when Facebook didn't monetize mobile at all, a long time, it seems like a long time ago now, it seemed like, can they possibly do that? Can they do it successfully? And they've managed to do it. 
the revenue is way up when it comes to mobile advertising in the past two quarters. And I'm still just staggered by their uh, active uh, monthly users at 1.15 billion active users. How is that even possible? They keep growing and growing. They're going to run out of people. Well, yes, there is a finite number of people in the world, although that number is growing. So I guess once Facebook reaches the whole world, it'll grow a little bit just based on birth rates. They're just going to issue the Facebook ID when you're born. Here you go, your social security card or whatever. Just in case you want Facebook. it. Facebook.com slash yeah. new guy. We'll go ahead and verify you because you have been processed through this hospital. It'd be really useful, though. That way you can have that vanity URL right away, no confusion. Yeah, you yeah. Know, that way, if they're, maybe Facebook should be in charge of naming people. That way it works a lot easier. What happens though with the with the vanity Facebook plate land grab because there are so many kids who will have the same names? No, Facebook should be naming the children, is what I'm saying. Oh. That way they can decide the vanity URL right up front. Well, they want so much of our data anyway. Why not at least brand us the way that they'd I, like to off of the bat? And then they can keep saying they're growing at a crazy rate. And then, well, there, there are jokes that I'm, I'm trying to not say now. So what do you, what, what do you think? In, in all seriousness, yep. there is going to be some sort of a slowdown of adoption. Yeah, Facebook can continue to monetize better as people continue to start accessing Facebook via mobile or more so. But what's, is, this, is this the end of the road for Facebook as far as thinking outside the box as revenue streams go? Because they've got Facebook gifts. I mean, who's really utilizing that very often? I, don't see, I, I really don't see anybody using that too much. It seems kind of like a novelty thing. Well, they could charge for stickers. I don't know if they charge stickers already. That seems they to be don't popular. as of now. They do have a lot of video and chat services that are being rumored, kind of like Hangouts. They could start charging for something like that. And there was that, what, that weird idea by, was it Biz Stone who was yeah, saying yeah, Facebook one of the Premium founders of Twitter. to strip out the ads? It's really about getting all the data they can to have the most relevant ads, and that way they, people click it. So it doesn't really matter if they, uh, if, if they are on every device so much as will people interact with the ad, because that's what's making them more money. And people just love giving information to Facebook. Thanks to Facebook Connect on pretty much every site, you're feeding them more and more data. Those ads will get better, and you might be tempted to click it. The real question is on the desktop. Can they keep growing there? Because their ads, at least for me, I'm just blind to them. Yeah. So unless, unless they're integrated better, in a way that I want to interact with them, I, I don't know how that's going to work out. It's still weird to me the way that ads work when they get targeted. So on Facebook, for example, this just happened to me the other day because I have been looking at you know upgrading some furniture, and I looked at this table on this website. It was too expensive, but I was like, oh, that's a really I really like the style of table. I don't even remember the the brand. And you know, beautiful table. I looked at a few different views of it, and then I went on my way. And within an hour, an ad for that table showed up on Facebook. And it's like, I understand why it showed up, but it's not really all that relevant because first of all, that has to do with something that I already did, mm -hmm. not something that I'm about to do. And I already didn't buy the table and I'm not planning on it. Maybe. Facebook doesn't know enough about my habits, it just knows that I went there. Maybe they, they expect people to be like me. I hem and haw and I'll waste a lot of time. I'll look at something, like yeah, maybe I'll buy that piece of art. Nah, I won't spend. I won't spend that money. And I'll go back and forth for like a couple of hours, and the ad will show up on Facebook. I'll see it, you know, art.com, and I'll see this brilliant photo or a lithograph of Captain America. That I'm like, ah, you don't want to spend two hundred dollars on it. But enough times, you'll see it. You might finally break down. I don't know if it's about uh, a, that immediate thing that you're looking at, like a like a table. But if something you're just kind of going, will I, will I bother to ever buy something like this? Maybe a car something that takes a long time to make a purchase decision, that's yeah. when it's really relevant. But if it's something like a milkshake or something, you don't really need an ad for that showing up. Right. Yeah, it's, it's not a perfect system. It's interesting how it works, though, how the, how the stuff ends up surfacing. You know, it's like, oh, I bought this pair of shoes. I don't really need to see those shoes in an ad. I already bought them. Does or, it make you feel bad when you're like, those were better shoes. They had a better deal there. I'm like, oh, no, I bought my hiking shoes at store A, and now store B has a better deal, and now I feel awful. I feel like I'm only getting targeted from the originating manufacturer. Yeah, I need, I need the sales sites to start mm -hmm. targeting me shoes and tables. I don't know, I have expensive taste apparently. That's why I never buy anything. So speaking of buying things, uh, Pinterest more than ever has sort of become associated with not just a place to pin stuff that you like, but a place to click through and buy stuff that you like. But Pinterest has joined a variety of other social networks by saying, we're going to offer you as a Pinterest user the opportunity to opt out of tracking so that we can advertise to you in a, as some people would say, in an intrusive way. So you can, of course, share photos 
and a variety of other media on your pin boards on Pinterest. But they're enabling Do Not Track. It's a feature that, of course, uh, you can uh, turn on or off uh, in a variety of browsers. Avoid cookies that collect your personal information, as well as third-party cookies, uh, which includes uh, stuff that would be used for advertising. Uh, Twitter started uh, uh, implementing this over a year ago, May 2012, I believe. So this is something that, I don't know, does Pinterest lose out here? I know it makes people feel good. Oh, I, I don't know how many Pinterest users will ever notice or care. Does Pinterest already have ads on it? I don't use it very often, so I'm just kind of curious about that. Pinterest has, y yes, yeah, not on its mobile, uh, okay. not in, in the mobile version of it. So on the web version, there's there are ads in it, so now you can not be tracked, so you're not going to have these targeted ads, I would assume. Yeah. Uh, I guess it seems like there's something, it's kind of like a checkbox thing, you have to have this. Uh, so if Twitter has it, if Pinterest has it, because Pinterest is one of the largest or, or fastest growing uh, social networks, or I don't even I don't, I don't really consider it a social network. It seems to me like it's a website. It's almost a you can follow people. It just doesn't feel like it's terribly social to me. Uh, maybe because I'm not very good at, at pinning things. Well, I bet you'd be. It's it's. There's not much of a learning curve. I bet you'd like, be a great pinner well, if you wanted to be. The the interesting thing about Pinterest is you might say like, well, I don't see a lot of advertisements on Pinterest. I mean, where where are all the ads? And it's a lot more of Pinterest saying, hey, well, if you liked this food related board, maybe you'd like these four others because we're tracking your activity. So it's Pinterest advertising itself mm -hmm. to nice you okay. more than here's a, you know, a, a fancy car that maybe you want to buy because here you are on Pinterest and Mercedes gave Pinterest some money. So it's a little bit more of a recommendation engine, which can be really, really useful. I've been in this home improvement project. So I've actually been using Pinterest a lot more than I normally would. And it's a great place to get lost, especially when you kind of get into like home design and interior stuff, because that's a big, big subset of what Pinterest people like to pin. And when I get into someone's board where I go, gosh, whoever this is has a really good taste and stuff. I just like, I like the look of this designer's uh, little collections. Then all of a sudden, what Pinterest is suggesting to me is also cool, and then I get down my whole rabbit hole of Pinterest. So I actually kind of like that. If Do Not Track turned off that functionality, Pinterest would be a lot less interesting to me, but I would be, you know, more private. Yeah, it seems like not a lot of people take advantage of that on something like Pinterest because of what you're saying. You want to use it as discovery at certain times. So if you want to see uh, a particular back to tables or shoes or cars, whatever it is, you want to have an ease of discovery. Otherwise, you're, you're constantly searching. You're not finding anything. So I don't know if the masses, uh, whoever's using Pinterest is going to be like, oh, this is the feature we wanted. But for some people who are just like, okay, I just want to use this to keep track of things. Because I know they have the private boards now at this point. Yeah. So they just want to keep that kind of feel of, this is my private collection of things that I want to see. You don't want that tracking. I think this is a very small section of Pinterest. Because the majority seem to be about finding things, repinning, looking at other objects. So that way you can have discovery. Well, and if you, if you have a do not track uh, feature that's part of a social network that is very large, and Pinterest is, it's like even if no one really utilizes it, no one can accuse you of not offering that yeah, at the same time. Checkbox. You know, nobody can 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 write some sort of a, you know, a, a everybody panic type of a headline saying Pinterest is following everybody, because then Pinterest could say we have do not track. I know, just that was like weird Twitter. with the do not track and don't follow with Twitter in particular, because yeah. that's the whole follow. Right. I know. It's all about choice, I guess. Uh, speaking of Twitter, this is a great article on the Wall Street Journal that favoriting tweets on tw Twitter is on the rise. People are favoriting <laughs> more than ever. And I kind of had to laugh uh, because I don't do a whole lot of favoriting. But it's interesting because the article, is, it, it kind of gets down into the nitty gritty of, well, there are a variety of reasons that people might favorite a tweet. Now, I don't know if you do any favoriting or why. I never favorite anything. With, I mean, in the history of my time on Twitter, which is what, like five, six years now, yes, I've favorited a few things because they were funny or poignant. But most of the time, they're just bookmarks. If someone says something like, this new iOS app called Xspot uh, is awesome, I'll favorite that because I just want to come back to it later. And I don't really want to click on whatever link that they linked to, or maybe there is no link. So it's just my bookmark. 
But the person who sent out that tweet will get a notification if they have notifications for favorites turned on that I favorited that tweet. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they understand that I favorited it because I work on iOS shows. But maybe they think that I just thought it was the best tweet that they ever sent. I read this article a couple of times because I couldn't believe the way people are using favoriting. Some guys were like doing it as a joke. Some of the most hated things they saw on Twitter, like, I'm going to favorite that. They call it hate favoriting. Hate favoriting. There's, uh, and then there's uh, this idea of showing people you think it's funny what they're writing. So I'm going to yeah. hit favorite there, not retweet right. it. This, uh, what they were calling almost like a private metric because you're not seeing the retweet show up on a timeline and it's only going to that one person, almost like voting. And I was just like... Who was thinking of that much work when you hit that button? Because when I do it, which is like very rarely, yeah. it's something I want to see later. And like a bookmark where, okay, that was a really good point. I need to remember this or I'm looking for an app or whatever it is. That's what it's for for me. Like I've never thought once to be like, oh, you know what? That Louis C.K. tweet was so hilarious. I better vote for it by hitting the favorite button. I know. It's like, Well, and then there's there, there have been folks who, who will say... Because as you mentioned, when you favorite a tweet, that's not public information, although there are third-party applications mm -hmm. that will, will, will keep track of that. But you're basically almost like high-fiving somebody privately because they know that you favorited yep. it, but it's not like some, let me blast out, best tweet ever to all of my followers. But then sometimes, as we all know, people will get into heated arguments on Twitter. There's, you know, little, like, Twitter fights. And you can sort of like give somebody kudos privately without really inserting yourself into the argument that way. Right, sort of at replying two people to tell them you're taking one person's side. But also in the, in the embedded tweets, you see the amount of retweets, but you'll never see the amount of favorites, right? Yeah. So, that, so does, this, does this beg for Twitter to have like a vote up, vote down kind of Reddit style thing That's that they can question. only have? That wouldn't be shown to everybody else because there are these third parties. Anytime a third party does anything with Twitter, I'm like, when is Twitter going to steal this? Yeah. So Twitter has got this this metric that nobody's seeing other than the end user. And then you could say that, oh, yeah, you know what? It turns out my post is actually really, really influential because I have 80 million uh, uh, favorites. Well, Twitter will, will show you the number of favorites, right, on any given tweet. I know at TweetBot, which I use on my iPhone and my iPad and even on my Mac, uh, hooks into Favestar, okay. which is a favoriting third-party application, which is, it's also interesting in this exact same article, the people over at Favestar uh, explain how depending on how quickly something is favorited after a tweet goes live says a lot about the sentiment. It tends to be, if you get a lot of favorites right away, the tweet was funny because mm -hmm. it's people kind of going like, knee-jerk reaction, favorite, I loved that, that type of a thing. I just don't know if I, I just, I don't, when I was reading this, I just don't do that behavior. So I was just trying to figure out who is doing that. It's just like, I must interact with everything I find funny. It's like, don't people just look at something, laugh, and then just move on? And then look at the next thing? Or they well, I think that's a lot of what favoriting is. I don't think a lot of people are managing their favorites. Although I do unfavorite everything after I've gone back and looked at it and been like, this iOS app is now either a bad app or it's going into my next show. You're managing, yes. I do. I do unfavorite things. Thank goodness people don't get... A, a notification for that? <laughs> that I unfavorited because well, it's like, about, I just don't want it in my list anymore. What about hate favoriting, though? That doesn't actually mean that that thing is a favorite. If that's an actual thing that people do, which I was unaware of, how do you work with that metric? You know, I have no idea. I don't think to my, to, in, in, in my memory that I've ever hate favorited anything. However, I do have a weird example of, I got in a car accident earlier this year, mm -hmm. and the first thing I did, because I wasn't thinking clearly, is I tweeted about it. You know, like, I've been, in a car, I've been in a car accident, I'm in shock. I got a lot of favorites on that tweet. And they started to come in, mm -hmm. and I only have notifications for favorites turned on for people that I follow. So there were, yeah, I wasn't getting a notification every time I, I got favorites, but people that were my friends were favoriting it, and I remember being very confused by that. Right. Because I was just confused in general in the couple of hours after I'm like, oh my God, I have no car anymore. Why is my friend Chris favoriting this? Is he happy that I got in a car accident? It was confusing. It's like the Facebook like, and that's why the, the verb had a change for like red or something else, that you wanted to say you supported something or I'm concerned, but a favorite is really a bad, like it's a bad term if you're saying someone's car accident right. or if you're, in, in, you're agreeing with somebody. Yeah. There's, there's just a star. So the thing is, do they need verbs like Facebook has now? It's possible. Yeah, maybe the star is, maybe it just shouldn't be called favorite. I don't know.
maybe maybe favorites are on the rise. Maybe we should just have a variety of different um, a drop emoticons. Menu. It's like, okay, I want a star. This one, no, this one. Twitter is be, stickers. This one will be a crescent moon. This will be a lucky clo clover, four-leaf clover. <laughs> Wait, that's a different thing. <laughs> uh, speaking of Twitter, and we talked about this on TNT yesterday, Chipotle, uh, earlier in the week, had uh, had faked basically, what do we even call this? A social media meltdown. We talk, Amber and I talk about social media meltdowns uh, with glee on this show regularly when uh, companies do stuff that looks really stupid. Chipotle, uh, earlier in the week, had tried to make it seem like somebody had gotten into the Chipotle Twitter account and started posting things like, what am I doing? Hello, mittens 13, password leave. Hi, sweetie, can you pick up some lime salt and onions, Twitter? And made it seem like somebody has no idea mm -hmm. how to use Twitter and that it's not actually the same thing as Google search or instant messenger or email. Now, the, they got a lot of attention in, in right away. You know, someone said, oh, Chipotle, somebody, some intern who's clueless is, is managing Chipotle and this account is, is, this is really funny. I thought it was fake. I will admit, I wasn't the only buddy who thought it was fake. Turns out Chipotle said, yeah, yeah, it wasn't really anything. We just did that This on completely purpose. flew under my radar because I usually don't care if no, Chipotle gets hacked. No, nor should or, you. Or these other things. I'm more concerned with passwords and things leaked. That seems, you know, or credit card information. Very, very important. But if somebody's Twitter account looks like it's being written by like a 90-year-old person who has no idea what Twitter is, or by you know a five-year-old who has no idea what Twitter is, it just seems strange that oh, this happened on, a, on I think it was Sunday. It was debunked this week. Yeah. As as a really dumb scam. So like, I don't know what publicity they get other than you hear the words Chipotle hacked or whatever, and then you go into the store to get a burrito. Like it doesn't seem to have this natural flow of here's this great viral thing and we're all gonna pretend like we're. We messed up, and then you're gonna come in out of what sympathy? We're sorry you got hacked. Can you make me a burrito? Like I don't see how this translates to sales. No, well, I think that for many brands, just the idea that people said the brand name Chipotle Enough a few times. times is a good thing. Chipotle has been in the news for interesting social media campaigns in the past, though, that are kind of like thought of as clever. Remember they had that great uh, that commercial with um, Willie Nelson singing the singing the oh they play it during the Not Super at all. Bowl. Well, anyway, I don't recall that, but this, this, that does make sense because I, I remember the study about uh, children's names and during Hurricane Katrina that name is said so many times. These K sounding names, yeah, those the number of babies named with the K sound went up by like 20 or 30 percent right. just because the name was heard again and again right so even if you heard it on the local news chipotle 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 at some point even though you don't even know what the story is it might have worked as advertising even though it was just kind of a silly thing that happened i i mean it's it's pretty if it's pretty yeah you know four thousand followers the day of the hack uh whether or not those followers will stay for very long remains to be seen I always wonder, it's like, who are these people who say like, ooh, interesting story, let's follow Chipotle. Maybe it's like hate following. Maybe that's another thing. Maybe it was there's hate following. Hate, hate favoriting, hate following. Well, I think that there's a little bit of a, it's, um, there's that kind of like schadenfreude, right, that mm -hmm. you find online where if somebody actually thought, oh, Chipotle doesn't know how to handle their Twitter account, this is awesome. I want to make sure I'm here for this Let's next time. Let's see what time. happens next. I want to see that. Let's follow. It's just so, it's like, oh, it's so lame. It's so lame as a company to be like, yeah, we, we, we were just kidding. How many we Chipotle made that up. Are they going to unfollow? That's the question. So if, what if they're not managing their Twitter list? So now they're going to see the Chipotle ad later. And say, hey, that was a great whatever. It right. always keeps showing up. So maybe it's a long-term strategy where people forgot they followed Chipotle that Sunday. Like, who's like, unless you're, I don't, if you really keep your accounts low, mine, mine's like 150. That's if, pretty low. If you're following you know, like 2,000, 3,000 companies or people, yeah, you might not even be aware that you kept following these guys. Right, and then you'll be marketed to genius Chipotle, absolutely genius. Well, let's move on to uh, the pretty much the most important news of the week, and that is the royal baby. Uh -huh. I, as I know, uh, you're a real Anglophile, and you That's follow me. the royal family. Absolutely, every day. And uh, this is all very important to you. Mm. But let's just say that it wasn't. Let's say you were one of 
I don't know, three or four people on the in the world who's just not all that interested. I will try to get into that mindset. In the royal baby news. Okay. If so, The Guardian, of course, which is a UK publication, will let you switch off royal baby news so that, because in, in all seriousness, some people are very interested in this, some people are not. In fact, the people that are not, the people just don't really want to hear about the royal family ever, and the royal baby is just not one of those things. The Guardian says, we don't want to lose you people as, as, as visitors to our website. We will let you toggle on and off uh, the Guardian with royal baby headlines and the Guardian without, as if it never happened. What do you think? I like it. It reminds me of... Uh there's certain like sometimes sports sites will take you know take off the Olympics because you want to just ca capture something else. Or, yeah. Uh, there's this nice option to remove things. It's almost like a mute. You yeah. want to just mute this. This I don't know if if they have to do this for lots of different things, but it's definitely a smart idea if people are getting overload because I believe up till the birth there was all these effectively just reporters waiting outside constantly reporting nothing has happened yet, but we're waiting. Right. And this would be the report for hours and days, to obviously an end at some point. But this idea of no news, no news, and now it's going to be every little thing about uh, about a royal baby. Uh, and no, I'm not really following this every day. I can't help but follow it because on Reddit people get so angry about it, so you have to read it because they're just like, this is horrible. I'm like, I don't, I guess I'm apathetic to it. I don't really care one way or another when it comes to the royal baby. I guess I hope it's healthy. There you go. Sure, yeah. I do care. Well, well uh, uh, Prince George. George, yep. Alexander. Uh, Louis. Louis. Yes. Gal, right. My gal. pal Gal. Yeah, my pal Gal. I think that in general, whether or not it's a story like this or maybe a story, uh, you know what stories drive me crazy are um, you know, courtroom drama uh, uh, unfolding, stuff that I'm not, I, I, I'm interested in the verdict, I guess, but I don't need the day-to-day -day stuff. And some of that, you know, you might be on one side of the fence or another about that sort of thing. I like the idea of being able to mute that on a publication that I otherwise want to visit regularly, no matter what it is. And I think that's, it's a really good call for The Guardian. And we're actually going to, there's another story that's kind of similar to this that, uh, that uh, relates to Gawker, which is an online publication that's just a little bit more of allowing you to personalize your news experience on a site. Yeah, I'm just thinking about some extensions for Chrome or Firefox where they just replace words out for you. So if you're seeing words like synergy or whatever, you know, boilerplate words you've seen, they'll put in like ponies or, or some kind of cat. That should be a, something a website should try. Like anytime they're talking about this baby, they just replace it with grumpy cat. And I'm sure people that will actually <laughs> go and see, they will, they will read about it. Oh, I love it. All right. Well, that's some of the news of the week here on The Social Hour. It's quite a bit of news, but, you know, we've got other stuff to get to in our hour. Reminder that we do record The Social Hour live on Fridays at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. Uh, thanks to everybody who does watch and listen to us live. We love having you. Of course, if you can't, we offer all of our episodes on demand, video and audio feeds as well. You can grab all of that at twit.tv slash TSH. It's also where you can follow up on any of the links to story articles and a variety of services that we talk about uh, on each of our episode pages we've got a little show notes area down at the bottom so you never have to feel like you can't go back to what we were talking about you will be able to uh, to uh, stay with us and of course you can email us at the social hour at twit.tv as well if you have any feedback or ideas or comments on anything that we cover on these shows all right, guys, before we get into some of our spotlights and our social media tips, we want to take a moment to thank Warby Parker for sponsoring this episode of The Social Hour. I'm really excited because I actually just got my brand new, these are a, this is a new model of Warby Parker sunglasses. Because I don't actually use prescription glasses, so I don't need to wear glasses, but I wear sunglasses all the time. Warby Parker can do both for you. So this is my new, this is my new pair of glasses. Now, I like to go kind of big. I, can I like see that. I like to you know cover my face go big or you know go to home. feel like I'm sort of a you know sort of a Jackie O celebrity don't want anyone to notice me exactly keep all the sun out what do you think you like them I, I think they're very large and I think they look very nice though <laughs> uh, 
They were about three quarters the size of her head. I'm just kidding if you listen to the audio. They're, they're very stylish. They're nice. I was yeah. looking into it because I would love to get some prescription sunglasses for yeah. myself because I wear corrective lenses all the time on my head. So I would like to get something stylish. Yeah, these are great. I'm uh, I'm, I'm very very happy with them. What's what's nice about uh, Warby Parker is this is this is a you know, it's, this is high quality glasses uh, that you shop for online. But you can make sure that you end up with a pair of glasses that looks good and suits you. I mean, Warby Parker glasses are made with high quality materials, same as what you'd find in a high end boutique, uh, but they're, they're offered at really, really low prices. They're styled after classic vintage frames. So you don't have to get expensive eyewear that kind of all looks the same. The glasses are, you know, they're very hip. People look really nice. A uh, few manufacturers, uh, you might notice if you go into one of those you know, those sunglass shops you find at the mall or inexpensive department stores, and you know, it's 300, 400, even 500 bucks. That just doesn't make sense. At Warby Parker, glasses start at $95, and that includes prescription lenses for people like I as. Titanium collection starts at 145, also includes prescription lenses. Uh, high premium Japanese titanium and French non-rocking screws. These are nice glasses. I've, I've had a pair of Warby Parkers in the past, and, and I I can attest they're nice. All glasses include anti-reflective and anti-glare coating, a nice hard case, a cleaning cloth. I throw this in my purse along with my glasses and I never have to worry about them getting scratched up because they're absolutely, absolutely cared for in here. And you know, there's nice, it's sort of like a little velveteen interior so I don't have to worry about my glasses getting scratched up. I probably shouldn't be wearing these glasses when I'm talking to you and looking you in the eye that very rude, but I just like them so much. I can't wait to wear them on my way home from work today because it's sunny out there. No additional costs and no additional items that you need to purchase. So here's the way that you can make sure that these glasses are awesome for you. Warby Parker has a free home try-on program. Go to warbyparker.com. Then you choose five pairs of glasses that you think, okay, I think these are the five, my top five. Warby will send them to you so you can try them on. They send them to you in this nice little box here. That is really awesome because isn't that great? When I got to go to get eyewear, I got to take the day off. I have to go to the to the, to the eye place. Yeah. And this just comes to your house. I basically said, all right, here are you know the five. You know, do I like these? Oh yeah, these are nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or am I more? You know, am I looking for aviator look? Something that's a little bit more aviator. I got like a silver thing going on. I like those. See, when I tried these on, I was like, they're not really me. But I might not have known that had I not been able to try them on. If I just bought them off the website, I might have ended up with glasses that I didn't think were perfect for me. So the home try-on program is awesome. What you do is you say, all right, these are the frames that I want. Of the five, the, these are the perfect glasses for me. Warby Parker will take care of the rest. You send these back. You get your nice, beautiful pair of the sunglasses that you want in your nice case. And... Almost most importantly, for every pair of glasses you purchase, Warby Parker will send a pair to someone in need. They partner with a variety of nonprofits like Vision Spring to help give uh, people who, you know, might need uh, uh, glasses but don't have the funds for them around the world. So this is something that you can uh, you can feel good about and also get nice glasses at the same time. So be sure to check free home try on at Warby Parker. Why not, right? Get some glasses, see what one's right for you. Then when you decide to purchase, enjoy expedited delivery when your glasses ship by using the offer code Social hours. So you can really make it an impulse purchase. Social hour, all one word, uh, as your offer code when you decide to purchase at WarbyParker.com. And we thank them for sponsoring this episode of the Social Hour. And I'm very excited about my new glasses. I even chose the. I don't exactly remember what the what the, what the style was, but they had a few different colors in this style as well. So if you say something like, "Gee, I love Sarah's glasses, but they're a little too dark for me," mm -hmm. they've got a little bit more of like a rosy lens version, a version that's sort of a, more of a gold. If you wear a lot of brown, my mom had glasses like that in the '70s. Just, just. You are the worst. What? I like my mom. My glasses like, are awesome. You know, at least at least you're honest. Everybody's got different opinions of what. Well, I gotta give you some flack. I just, what looks good as far as glasses goes. Anyway, Warby Parker, uh, check them out. They're awesome. Hey, so I mentioned before the break that Gawker. Uh, Gawker.com was also experimenting with a little bit of help the community figure out what version of Gawker they would like to read. So it's not so much of a, hey Gawker, I don't want to hear anything about the royal baby. There's even more to it. And I'm sort of trying to get my head around this. Uh, uh, an article that I read 
over at uh, Neiman Lab explains that Gawker is trying to let their readers help rewrite headlines and reframe articles. So let's say that there's some sort of a headline I as that uh, you find on Gawker uh, that there's actually a, a, an example in this Neiman Lab article that was uh, a Canadian man caused an international accident for a drunken <laughs> bet, right? Right. So that's the original article. Mm -hmm. And then, it, and then it got updated based on uh, what a reader had submitted, and and kind of like votes. There's a little bit of like a crowdsourcing element here to update the article that maybe puts it into a different context or highlights the part of the story that ended up being the most interesting to readers. They're working with a website called. Kinja, K-I-N-J-A, which is basically a, a content from Gawker Media that, that, that presents Gawker submissions in more of a sort of like a dig or a Reddit style okay. of, of, of headlines that then you can interact with as a reader to let them know what you're most interested in. So in a way, I guess if you, if you, try, to, if you try to explain this, in, in a very simplistic way, it's less of page views, a story saying, oh, this story got the most amount of page views, therefore it's the most popular, to stories that people want to interact with a little bit more and say, I'm interested in this story, here was the most interesting paragraph. Maybe you want to put that closer to the top. Yeah, instead of just, a, instead of user feedback being relegated to comments. So it's letting the users kind of be editors then when it comes to the way this yeah. stuff is presented. Yeah, to an because extent. Sometimes when I look at news stories, it seems like the most interesting uh, part of the story is this one-liner that seems like a throwaway. It's like, wait a second, that's really important. It's interesting to try to, to reframe it. it but Gawker is the company that lets you do the comments right on their actual pictures at this point, right? They do a lot of these things to try to keep a lot of interaction with the audience. Uh, it's, it's hard to keep an audience interested in this stuff, and Gawker's been famous for having some headlines that are not necessarily yeah. entirely on point. It's known as being a sensationalist network at times, so definitely. Th this can move it in either direction, though. That's the thing. It can be more sensationalistic, or it could be more, more uh, journalistic, so you have these dead-on, accurate headlines. But this particular story, the example story, is awesome. You, you read the story about this, this Canadian who swam across... A river. <laughs> I, I did not read that uh, that story in great detail. Yeah, I couldn't tell if it was. I don't know if this is an example. Or this was even real. But this this story is a, supposedly about a guy who drank eight beers and then swam across the Detroit River just to prove to his friends he could. But since he was doing it from Canada, it was an international incident. So right, right. awesome headline rewritten because the original headline was something boring like Canadian man caused an international incident. Yeah, yeah. This is chugging eight beers and swimming to Detroit. Like. Much better writing, but I I don't know what the end impact's going to be in general for Gawker, though. I think I think that I spend a fair amount of time on Gawker, and I'm not always proud of the stuff that I'm reading on Gawker. Some of it is actual news, and some of it is like, oh, God, valet rag type stuff. Mm -hmm. However, I will give the Gawker community one thing, and that there are quite a few very funny, um, clever good one-liner type of commenters who hang out on Gawker. That there are good commenters on, on, on lots of, uh, of different social networks and, 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 and tech blogs and that sort of thing, but I find some of the Gawker comments are the best parts of an article. It just happens to be my opinion. So I can see how Gawker is saying, you know, these people should have a bigger voice. Sometimes they've, they've, got the, they've got the funniest headline that none of our editors would have thought of or our writers would have thought of. So it's very forward thinking of the Gawker uh, enterprise to try to give people the potential to, to, to basically help them be better. And these rewritten headlines are gonna be in the actual Gawker sites or are they just gonna be in a different In area? time, okay. they potentially will. Okay. In time, this is not something that's 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 live right now. I mean, you're not going to be able to rewrite things that you see on Gawker. But in time, yes, potentially. That's a really interesting way to keep interaction. You're right; those comments are pretty ridiculous because sometimes they're pretty good. Because sometimes the the article is just flat out. It's like flame baked the article itself, and then boom, you have this amazing conversation that builds after it. So, uh, Gawker. Now, I, I used to write a bunch of link bait stuff, so I I don't uh, make too many jokes about 
sensationalistic headlines. Back in your old link bait days. Link bait days. That you was were my young. Job. You needed the money. Yeah, it was a long time ago. <laughs> Well, speaking of needing money, uh, advertisers, uh, that's how they make their money. Uh, this is an interesting uh, story over on Ad Age about brands and Instagram video. We've already seen some of this where a, you know anybody could can have an Instagram account and there are a variety of, of brands that have Instagram accounts. Some of them have a lot of followers. And the idea is, well, you know, why did Instagram make their videos 25 seconds? I think it is, right? 15. What, uh, Instagram? I, th I think it's 25, it's 25? isn't it? 25? I thought it was, okay. Oh, yeah, just something like 15. Chat room. Maybe, maybe it is 15. I, I don't know. But it, long enough so that it could technically sort of be the same uh, amount of time as an ad spot. Instagram video has only been live for about a month. Oh, 15 seconds. You're right. You're right. Uh, and there's an incident here where Carnival Cruises had posted nine clips of people you know, enjoying a carnival cruise, right? So it's like there was a video of, you know, uh, passengers that were on the deck tanning themselves and, and, and hanging out with a, with a bartender who was making them some drinks. And then all of these videos disappeared. And this was part of Carnival's official account. Uh, the company's marketing department uh, said that uh, Instagram removed them because they had violated Instagram's terms of service or had at least been flagged as far as seeming to violate the terms of service. This is according to a Carnival spokesperson. And whether or not Carnival did this uh, and, 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 and meant to or just uploaded a bunch of videos, um, the videos weren't shot using Instagram, so they were uploaded, they, they were originally shot some other way and then uploaded using Instagram. So that may in fact be a violation of the terms of service mm -hmm. because of course you're supposed to be taking the photos from within Instagram. You don't, or, or videos rather, you don't have to take photos from within Instagram though. That's always been like a, you're not supposed to, the community will call you out if they think that you're taking beautiful pictures on a fancy SLR camera and then uploading them, but it doesn't stop you from doing so. Yeah, I would think with the videos, the actual ads themselves, I don't know how you'd want to shoot it on uh, on, on, I guess a phone or you shoot it on some kind of, unless there's some kind of device like the Galaxy camera, I guess, that you could shoot an actual video on and put it right to Instagram that way. I, I just wonder if this is just a, a terms of service violation for like commercial entities like this. Yeah. But repurposing their ads, the 15 second ones, I could see Instagram just saying, they look, if you're going to a advertise on us, have your own unique content, have people have a reason to be here, but it's also still an ad at the end of the day. So yeah. I'm not really sure where to fall on this. I love the idea of of, uh, of Instagram trying to get advertising revenue, even though I'm sure people hate that. But I'm just like, okay, well, 15 seconds is just long enough that you can do a full-fledged ad, but do you really want to see somebody shooting an Instagram-style video uh, for 15 seconds for Carnival Cruise Lines? Is it just somebody running around with a little with a phone and posting that up? Is that more interactive, or do you want to see a polished piece of video? Because you're spending 15 seconds here. That's a long time. I think Instagram just wants a cut. Instagram is like, well, wait a second. Okay, well, if you post a photo, we're not going to go after you if we think that you didn't post it from within Instagram. Okay, fine. But if you post a video and you use some sort of a workaround, because when you post a video on Instagram, it's not like Instagram says, oh, of all the videos just sitting in your camera roll, which one would you like to upload? I mean, you mm -hmm. actually have to use a workaround that, that, that kind of gets around the way that Instagram is set up. But again, I don't think that the company cares unless it's a brand where it's like, well, wait a second, that's literally just a commercial. You just uploaded a commercial. And we don't want uh, entities like Carnival Cruise Line, a large company, to be able to do that without having some sort of an agreement with Instagram and, of course, by yeah, association Facebook. That's a nice way to say, hey, by the way, if you want to repurpose your ads, if you want to be able to use the stuff you already paid millions of dollars for, and you want to put it on our actual network, you're going to have to give us a little bit of money. Yeah. All right, let's move on to a secret project happening within Google that turns Google Hangouts, which of course is sort of a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a Skypey type of a service that allows Ayaz and I to have a, a video conference call, but yeah, or we Google could have Plus. a, or we could have a group of people and on a conference call together. Because <laughs> you're always on Google Plus. You know that's Aaron Lane. Won't shut up on Google Plus. You know, one of the things I wish we did more is video chatting. You're so right. Google Hangouts. We can do it right now. Yeah, I don't need right. To see it directly. Yeah, because we don't we don't do enough of that <laughs> already. 
But the idea is that, okay, so Hangouts is uh, one of these services that Google has had. It is uh, integrated nicely with Google+. Plus. Um, you, can, you can put together a public Hangout. Uh, you can have as, as not, well, not as many people as you want, but you can have lots of people uh, watching the Hangout and a, and a few people participating in the Hangout and, and, the, and the, the camera angles change depending on who's talking. It, it, it can work really nicely in certain situations. Apparently, according to sources who are talking to TechCrunch, Google has a way to turn Hangouts into a commerce platform. They're at least internally at this point calling it Helpouts. And this is a way for Google to offer, uh, uh, as, as an entity, whether your individual has a particular skill or maybe a company, uh, to provide services. So let's say that I was wanting to learn a new language. Maybe Rosetta Stone could have some sort of account that I could tap into on Helpouts and I could get a video demonstrations of how to learn something, a skill or a trade, or, or as a yoga instructor, you could teach a class via Helpouts. Maybe that class would be free. Maybe that class would be $10 a pop. Every time I, I'll, I'll, something about my brain, by the way, every time I saw the words help outs, because it's one word, I wrote, I kept reading help outs. I'm like, <laughs> what's that, what does that even mean? And now, now that I've seen it enough times. I'm I, helping you out. Oh, help out, not, not help out. Totally different thing. Uh, so I saw this, I'm like, this is a great idea if you want to do, uh, if you wanted to get businesses on Google Plus. That's what I kept seeing every time I thought of this. Because if you are going to be doing these help outs, you have to have a Google Plus presence. Mm -hmm. So you, if you're a business or you're a school or anything, you have your Google Plus page and you can say we have these classes and these instructional videos or whatever you want on your Google Plus page. It fills out so much content for Google because right now their social network is nowhere near what Facebook is. And if they can actually give uh, the, the users of, of Google+, Plus something that you just can't get somewhere else, right. like a Facebook or Twitter, you can get customer support on Twitter. You, know, you just never know when that guy from Comcast is going to write you back. But if they're willing to actually have these little sessions where I'm going to repair my, my washing machine from Sears, and Sears is going to show you that, as yeah. opposed to waiting for that, that could be really beneficial to the network as a whole. Uh, but there is that issue of, I think Google's finally figuring this out. If not enough people have headphones, there's this horrible still echo that happens. They've worked on it a lot. So if this is mature enough that a bunch of people can go on there without headphones and you don't have any of that weirdness with the actual technical issues, yeah, I think it'd be really cool. Well, especially since, okay, so Google's got YouTube and there's a lot of help and how-to videos that people upload to YouTube all the time. Mm -hmm. And then I think of... Yeah, if, if it turns into, again, like let's go back to the washing machine example. It's like if I'm... I've got a broken washing machine at home. You know, the first thing I probably do is type into Google something like, how do I fix a broken washing machine? And maybe there's a model number or something. And you just sort of like see what comes up in Google search results. And you might get some like about.com weirdness and, and these, 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 these query answers to a variety of questions. And I think Google would probably love to be up at the top of rankings with, uh, by having agreements with a company like Sears who has a variety of tutorials to help me do it myself. So this would bring a lot of expert content to Google. Yeah. So every time I do a search, I don't get that Yahoo answer, which for some reason is the number one it search result. It often is for me as well, All yeah. the time, and it's almost every time useless. I don't know why it's the number one. SEO must be fantastic. Yeah. But that answer is constantly up there. If Google has a catalog of all of this stuff, then yeah, it's great. They could probably either put it on YouTube if they can actually make it searchable. Video very hard to search right now. But if they're working with Sears or these other companies, they know they have a, like an actual outline as to what's going to happen. They could index it very well too, so they would have a really good service if they could put it together. Yeah, I love the idea of this. I, I I'm interested to see how Google rolls this out. If indeed this is something that we see as an actual product, because of course at this point these are just people familiar with the matter telling us of their plans. But I like the idea. Um, I, 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 I want to see help outs uh, turn into a real thing. All right, let's take another break and thank SAP for sponsoring this episode of The Social Hour with social media solutions from SAP. If you're a large enterprise, well, you're not the large enterprise, but you might be working inside one and needing to follow what people are saying about your company on social media, you can listen and engage with those people in a systematic way. It does not have to be rocket science. In fact, social media solutions is really easy to use. Two components. We got listening and we got engaging. Listening component is 
kind of what it sounds like. You're capturing reports about conversations that people are having about you. What do your customers like? Are they writing a scathing review of a product on a review site? Is that something that you know you need to know about in order to make a better product, build better products, because you're incorporating the customer feedback into your next innovations? Of course, you want to identify customers who are ready to buy your product, but maybe might be on the fence. Those are really important customers to reach out to based on their buying signals and things that they're saying on social media. Maybe it's on a personal blog, maybe it's on Facebook, Facebook or Twitter. And then uh, uh, Social Media Solutions also uses natural language processing to kind of parse out what people are saying. You know, is somebody angry? Is somebody really, really excited? Are they, you know, evangelizing your brand? These are all important things to keep in mind. And then, of course, there's that engaging component. That's SAP saying, okay, now it's time to, to interact with your community, help you improve customer service and support because you can set rules about which messages are coming in and getting sent to which member of your team is the best person to handle that issue. Maybe there's a tech support problem. You get it to the right person, fix that problem immediately, and then that customer says via social media, wow, this company was so awesome. They, you know, they really, really listened and they got back to me right away. You know, That's a happy customer and you want as many of those as possible. Activity on the social media stream can lead to direct customer engagement because you drive sales, awesome. You quickly solve customer problems, happy customers, and then you're responding to customer feedback and you're just staying on top of everything. Everybody knows if a bunch of complaints go out into the ether and a company isn't on top of it, that company looks really, really bad in the eyes of social media. And we all know how that can blow up in a bad way for a large enterprise or even a smaller enterprise. If somebody posts a negative review about you, you want to remedy that problem, but you also want to keep track of just what people are saying about your company because it helps you build better products down the road. Social Media Solutions from SAP gives you more than just marketing, a lot more, because it improves customer service and support experience. SAP.com slash twit is the place to go or the place to send your manager to find out more about social media solutions from SAP and how it can help your future innovation efforts. Take a guided tour over at SAP.com slash twit today and find out more about how social media solutions will help your enterprise. And we thank SAP for sponsoring our episode of The Social Hour. By the way, Amber's not here. And maybe you, don't, yeah, maybe you don't care either, but this is a palindrome episode, 121. I, I like numbers. I'm okay with that. I also do as well. I feel like this is a special show. because 121. We yeah, the last palindrome episode was 111, and that was a solid 11 weeks ago. So it doesn't, doesn't happen all that often. It's cause for a celebration. 141. Yeah, that's right. I like this idea. <laughs> and you don't need an excuse to celebrate, but that's the one well, you're going to come up with. let's have some cake. We've got some extra There's stuff. There's cake. Yeah. All right. Got some uh, three-day-old cake now. Mm -hmm. mm. Two-day-old. Two-day-old cake. It's still Less fine. moist. It's fine. All right. We got an email from Art uh, who says, Can I get a clout score without having a Twitter or Facebook account? You know, it had been so long since I logged into clout, I wasn't sure what the answer was. Uh, but Art, I, I'm sad to say that indeed the answer is no. You've got two options right now. If you don't already have an account, you go to clout.com because you want to see what your score is. You either sign in with Twitter or you, or you connect with Facebook. By the way, originally it was just Facebook. So at least they've expanded to two different networks. Yeah, I was just I'm looking at this. If you didn't have an account for either one, what clout would they be measuring? Your Google Plus one? Because that doesn't exist. There's no API. So what else could they look at? Well, th I mean, they, they, can look at, they can look at Google+, well, they can. LinkedIn, okay. uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, I think even Instagram followers. There are a variety of variables that affect your clout score. But as far as just signing up for an account, Clout says you either sign up via Twitter or Facebook. Those right. are, you can't just make an account using your email address. I think I've just completely forgotten about Clout unless I get an email saying you're eligible for a perk. Yeah. It's like, oh, a free sandwich? Okay. But otherwise, I'm just, I don't really check I, it that often. I had a discount for something from, I think it was McDonald's was my most recent Clout mm -hmm. perk. And it's like, I mean, if there was anything less relevant to me, well, I don't know what it, it is. I mean, you're influential. If you liked a McDonald's sandwich... 
an egg sandwich. I think that's what it was. I was eligible for that too. A little card. For yeah, that. I don't know. I, I, we were at we were at our Twit the two year anniversary of of the uh, of the Twit Studio the other it's night. True. And Leo was pulling up clout scores. Oh, was he? Yes, because he was boasting that his clout score is higher than mine. And I had to laugh at him. I'm like, what are you doing? Are we, is anybody paying attention? There Brian go. Burnett, a solid 38. He's Good the, work, Brian. That's the uh, TD in charge of all things behind us. Yeah. Sarah Got Brian Lane back there. Is at, uh, I'm at 83. 83. I, think Leo, I think Leo, at least two days ago, was at 88. I think I'm at negative 14 by now. I'm the opposite. I don't know. I just, it, <laughs> and Brian still can't spell my name. That's even better. <laughs> Way to go, Brian. That guy, that's, that's perfect. I'm cool with that. Good work. That's, that's my score. There you go. We got Leo at 88. I just don't know what what it means. It doesn't, 68. 68. Yeah, you're that's... right. You're neck and neck with me. Uh, yeah, I just, I don't know. I don't like ranking us. That always feels weird. My high school used to rank us by grades. That was really horrible. What do you was, mean rank? You like you grade. were you were ranked by your score, like whatever your average was. So oh. I was like, my first quarter, it was like 160 out of like 400. I thought that was good. But all my friends were above 50 or like lower than 50. Yeah. So I had to bring up my entire rankings. That's way more horrible than this. At least you can you can do something about that. With clout and you have to make sure that people are retweeting you. Or I don't know if they check favoriting or not. Or not. I think it all probably factors in in some way. I haven't paid much attention to clout because I don't really like popularity contests. However, clout is a lot less about that and more about perks, right? If they and have an perks. agreement with McDonald's and enough of us, uh, you know, I got my Fox, basically exercise our, our, our coupon. My Fox VIP sweat uh, hoodie, that is, thanks to, thanks to Clout. You really? can get like, yeah, they gave away hoodies with, I think it was uh, like a new girl promotion or really? some other show. They're like, here's a green sweatshirt. It's like, okay, all I'll right. Take it. Now you got a sweatshirt. Are I you do. wearing your new girl sweatshirt regularly? The, actually, the new girl promotion, I mixed it up. That one actually came with glasses and nail files. Oh gosh! I don't know why oh, they boy. sent that one. I didn't ex actually hit the button. No. <laughs> well, I didn't. Thanks, I didn't have my quarter pounder either. So if you oh, want I mine, out. I no. think. Yeah, I think it's probably expired by now. Got another email from John who says, I've been debating a concept for a long time. I'm not quite sure how to go about it. I have online friends and forums I enjoy, but I wouldn't put this in with my social life. Do I keep two accounts for things like Twitter and Instagram, or I just do I just merge both? and set things like Twitter to private so that actual tweets are not seen by random people, but I can still use my accounts. I think this is a, you know, it's a question that uh, it's, there's never really a right or wrong answer. I know for me, I find keeping too many different profiles cumbersome, so I just have the one. On Twitter, there's just one account. I don't have any like secret accounts anywhere. Well, the other thing is, you know, if you have a, an idea that you want to have on two different accounts, you don't want to end up retweeting the same thing or mm -hmm. having duplicate content. Then people find out why am I following both? Yeah. So that's why I also do just one because otherwise the other ones fall by the wayside. And then you have to find a manager. That's the other thing. Like like Hootsuite, so you can log into everything at once. Yeah. So it's kind of it's it's a lot more work if you really want to keep them separate. Yeah, that's fine, but. It's a lot of work to manage more than one Twitter account. But then again, let's say that he mentions, John, you mentioned Instagram. It's like, okay, well, I've got my personal Instagram account, and that's just, I don't know, it's my pictures, stuff that sometimes it's my friends or pretty pictures of trees or whatever. But then maybe I'm kind of trying to, like, also have my persona as, like, I take pictures of, this is not actually something I'm about to do, I take pictures of cool graffiti around San Francisco, and I call it, like, Graffiti Girl 23. Like, I, it's fine. Like, maybe that's a whole other thing that I want to cultivate as a persona on a social network. And that's, that is separate than my whole, oh, I'm Sarah Lane, normal person going about my life. And I think of fair amount of people do that, and I think that's fine. Yeah, sometimes people find you, they're like, oh, you're only about technology. This is the only thing I want to yeah. read about you. Could you please have a separate account for every picture of graffiti you have? That could be something you could do. And that's another point, too, is do you ever feel like if you go too off the rails of what people are used to seeing on something like Twit, then it ends up uh, affecting you negatively? On Google Plus in particular, that one's really tech, tech, tech. If I talk about anything beyond tech on Google Plus, it's, it's always why are you writing this here? That's usually the response. It's like, well, because yeah. I was sharing. Twitter, not so much. Twitter seems to be a little bit more friendly as far as I've been able to tell when it comes to that. So I guess it depends on the social network of it how does. the response is on that. I've, I've kind of grappled with that, especially uh, during uh, certain sport seasons because I like, I, I have my teams, right? Yes. And I, I like Dodgers. my sports. <laughs> 
don't even. Sorry, let I was just trolling. Kick you off I was of trolling. Set. Okay, I admit you to trolling. You were trolling in a big way. I like the the team that is it. Exact polar opposite of the Dodgers, of course. Uh, World Series champions. I'm aware. So, but but that's a great example of sometimes I get fired up and then I tweet a lot and it's like, I know that if you're expecting me to be, you know, sending out links to my favorite iOS apps and I'm tweeting about how the Giants are spanking the Dodgers or something, that's not what you're following me for and it can lead to, you know, people unfollowing you or just kind of being like, ugh, you suck type of a thing. But you don't want to be a one note person either. So I don't know, maybe for some people, maybe for you, John, it makes sense for you to be like, personal stuff is here, and if you are, for whatever reason, following me about a particular subject, I'm gonna separate the two. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I think it's just what you want to, what kind of effort mm -hmm. you want to put into it. It's a lot of work, so just pick one. Yeah, pick one and stick with it, or change your mind. You can do that too. Steve in Denton, Texas, speaking of Google+, and I'm actually glad you're here, Ayaz, because I know that you use Google+, Plus, um, and it's really helpful for your show mm -hmm. know-how. Definitely do. He says, uh, I was watching the show, uh, this was last week, Amber and I were talking about Google+, Plus. So he says, the first point about the low engagement and sharing on Google+, Plus, or at least what some people seem to think is low engagement, he says, while I have a small internet marketing company, social media plays a big part of it, I have a lot of friends who are not social media savvy, and the perception from my friends is that Google Plus is too public. I know there are ways to secure your posts, I know you can set up circles, but my friends complain about having strangers following them, and you're getting emails, and people are following you on Google Plus and you don't know them, and it creeps them out. They like Facebook because they have to approve friends. He says, I know you can have followers on Facebook for but you know, it can also be disabled. You can go in and block somebody who follows you on, on Google+, but that can also be a pain. And the whole circles aspect is just confusing for a lot of people. Facebook at least allows them to categorize things that make more sense. He says, well, you can put everybody into the same circle on Google+, it can be more tedious. He goes on to just sort of say, Google Plus seems like a different animal to a lot of people who aren't necessarily really tech savvy. And since a lot of my friends don't use it, it makes me less likely to use it. It boils down to the average person not wanting to have to work too much to use social media. Then he says, you also mentioned uh, the how-to page on Google Plus and setting up a page is certainly fine, but you wanna set up a community instead. I think it works better for engagement. So maybe you should uh, tell, talk a little bit about how you use Google Plus because Know How is a help and how-to show mm -hmm. and you solicit a lot of not just ideas from the community but, but, but help from the community on how to go through cer yeah, certain so we have things. A, we have a community at, uh, at gplus.to slash twitkh because I don't think we have a vanity URL for mm -hmm. a, a official one. And it's like 3,500 people in that community and they give show ideas and, and sometimes they just have questions that they are helping out each other. So they're, they're brought together by their they know the show and they know that they want to tinker with stuff. Usually, if you're watching a show like Know How, it's a help and how-to show about technology projects. So yeah. these people are very involved in trying to figure out how to do things. And so sometimes I'll just show up there and I'll see like a whole thread about how to use open DNS. Somebody has decided to ask the question and they'll be engaged with, with each other. And I'll come back and be like, wow, I just learned something huge here. So if you can get a community together, they seem to work really well. When it comes to a page or if I made these posts on my own, I just left it open. I've got like, I think I'm like followed or I'm in 20,000 circles or something strange. The engagement is not the same. I found it on a community because they have the same interests. Not they're, they don't want to hear what I have to say. Mm -hmm. They want to hear about the projects I'm doing. And that's kind of like what we're talking about with the having multiple accounts. By having a community, it works really well as far as I've seen uh, in, in uh, Google+. Although I, I, the whole circles thing, that is, it's useful. Uh, I can actually share things to the, to the know-how community because they're a circle effectively. Yeah. I did it with like hangouts and things. But yeah, these guys, they're very, very engaged with, if you have a community page. This is a great example of how Google Plus really, really shines because you wouldn't be able to replicate this any on any other social network. It kind of reminds me, like when I saw it, I'm like, this is forums. This is like old school forums, but done in a really clean uh, way that people understand it now. Mm -hmm. Because this is what I used to look at all the time. They just were always in this one giant column. Right. And you scroll down. Not visual. Not Images pretty. are buried. Yeah, images are hard to find. Image links are broken. Things on the left side. It just it yeah. didn't have this clean uh, uh, look. All you need is a Google account as well. So ev pretty much everyone has one. Yeah. So if they want to write something, they, could s they log in, they write something up, and there's no like, please sign up for this forum. Now if you want to upload, go to this third party. 
then do all this special stuff. It's all very easy to use because it's using all of these same concepts that you're familiar with with social networks. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting how, and again, Steve, I know you're not alone when you say just a lot of my friends think that Google Plus is, you know, it's not private and there's these circles and they don't know how to turn things off and they feel like they don't want to be, a, you know, too public about stuff. I don't really know what the solution is there. I don't know, maybe Google needs to invest a little bit in trying to become like Forums 2.0 or something. Because I think even even people who are not necessarily all that tech savvy understand, oh, the forum concept. There are conversations, threaded conversations See, I think that would scare on. people. That's the thing. Like if you tell people it's like a forum, they're like, no, I'm not going back to one of those. Because yeah, usually maybe. they're not, they were designed by engineers. And engineers are great, but they do functional looking things. And it's not the prettiest looking thing. It's just forums have been, um, utilitarian. That's the positive way to say it. I for think, a very long time. Yeah. Well, maybe it's because, at least for my social network, nobody thinks of Google Plus as a Facebook replacement. I know no. at the beginning we all thought, could it be? And it's not. Facebook is Facebook. Google Plus is something else. It can be a great utility, for example. It seemed like something that when when first used Facebook, you might have friended everybody, and then you didn't want to go through the thing of unfriending, so Google Plus looked like this new opportunity to restart. You're like, okay, now I'll put circles together. I'll be organized. It's like the beginning of a new year. I'll be organized. I got a new system. I can put people in circles, and I'll do this. And then the and then it's a mess. It waned. Yeah. Like, ah, well, I'll just go back to my old place. Right. Facebook. I have a ton of people have me in circles, and it, all I get is a bunch of crap. You know, wow, that's pretty harsh. Well, that's harsh. Most of what I get is it's like people are sharing posts with me, and it's all. I just, just no, none of it is relevant to anything, and I don't know. It's like a big fake community that doesn't exist. A big fake community. I think that's it's that's how I feel real. about Google Plus half the time. However, some of my Facebook followers are the same way. Every time I post something like, "Hey, a new episode of this show on Facebook," then I just get a lot of spam from people wanting me to click through to their weird music albums from. Okay, I just did that three times. Okay, I'm not really sure why. It's my Google you got to bring it up now. Lucy, see, I haven't, I haven't uh, even gone to my own profile in a while. June twelfth, twenty thirteen, the last post. <laughs> oh, Google Plus, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll come back. I promise. Yeah, you'd think with the YouTube ties, you'd be able to put up so many cat videos on Plus. I'm sure, I'm surprised. Do people really want that from me on Google Plus, though? Find out. I don't know. Yeah, I got to. I got to do it. I know. I know. I got to do it. Hey, quickly, a little uh, fun little app of the week before uh, we move on. Something called Self Control. This is a little Mac app um, that if you download it, it is uh, open source application, OS 10, 10.5 or above, that lets you, for either a limited time or indefinitely, block your own access to websites that might be distracting or certain email accounts or anything on the internet that for whatever reason you can't help but go to regularly and you want to, it's like basically tying your hands behind your back or the equivalent of it. I need this. I need this as well. I need this in a big way. Every time I go on Reddit, I find that like, oh, it's only been two minutes and then it's 30 minutes. And yeah. then when I, I, I try to exercise my own self-control, yeah. if I can manage to do it, I gain about an hour or two of pr productivity back a day. Yep. If I had an app to do it, yep. that'd be so cool. Yeah, this is, uh, this is, it's good stuff. Now, I find that in the morning, because we both work on TNT, TNT is a morning show. So Ayaz and me and Tom and Jason Hell, we all get up early and we read tech news like, head down, <laughs> yeah, I really can't do anything else for the first three hours of my day, every day. It's just the way it is. And I need self-control. I, I mean, I literally need this application self-control because I need to block my own access to Facebook. I need to block my own access to my Gmail account that never has anything relevant to Tech News Today. Some other, uh, you know, like the, our Twit mail account, maybe I'd need to mm -hmm. be able to tap into. But there are certain accounts that I just instinctively kind of go back to and all I'm doing is making it harder on myself to get through the day's news. And it's just one of those things. It's like you need to cut down on your multitasking. So if I, I usually have lots of tabs open. So like Facebook, Facebook will be open and so will Google, uh, Gmail and anything else. But the thing about the tabs is if something changes. So like my email account goes from 250 to 251 or that little one or two yep. shows up on Facebook. Now yep. I'm like trying to look at the lineup, trying. I'm like, things are happening. I gotta click it. I gotta click it. Yeah. I have to click it. And then 
I lost time again. Right, exactly. Because it's usually not something that's relevant, and then you end up going like, oh, I should just write her it back just a only bit. take a second. Yeah. Like, I don't like the way I wrote that. And then 15 again. minutes later, I'm like, oh my God, I have to be <laughs> on television really soon. So self-control, again, uh, selfcontrolapp.com. We'll have our links in the show notes. And if there are certain sites or services, you don't have to like tell us about your ex-boyfriend's blog that you want to block uh, that you want to block or anything, unless you want to tell us that story. But if there are certain networks that you find you need to not be able to check for maybe large periods of time or ever again, do let us know. The social hour Twitter TV. I would love to know um, if Ayaz and I are alone or if this is a, a widespread problem. Um, you can write us at the social hour Twitter TV. You can also leave us a voicemail if you've got an interesting tidbit or an idea or a question. You can call us 2626 S O C I A L. That's 2626 social is our Google voice mailbox. You can record a video, upload it somewhere, and send us the link as well if you're feeling brave. Uh, but uh, do get a hold of us because you help us build our show every week. All right, before we we get to Red or Fed, which was actually chosen by Amber, even though she's not here. She uh, she went ahead and did her duty. It's always Amber's Red or Fed. We want to thank 99 Designs first for sponsoring this episode of The Social Hour. 99 Designs is awesome because it connects people, maybe like you, who are looking for really, really good graphic design with a community of more than 225,000 graphic designers who have amazing skills from all over the world who want to be the designer for you. You might need a new logo, or maybe you're working on a mobile app. You've got a great idea, but you have no design skills to speak of. That would be me. Or maybe you want to design a really cool new business card or or, or put uh, your new logo or you know a funny slogan on a t-shirt, any kind of graphic design. 99designs is the place to go because you can find the right designer for your project. You just tell 99designs what you're looking for. Then 99designs kind of sends the word out, and dozens of designers from within the community will submit designs that created just that are created just for you based on what you said that you wanted. Then you give the designers your feedback, then you help them kind of refine their designs, and then you select the one that you like the most, and you go ahead and pay for that. So maybe you need a new Facebook or Twitter or social media design. You know, sometimes you see, you go to somebody's profile page and you're like, wow, that background is really slick. How'd they do that? 99 designs. Designers could help you with something like that. In fact, you can check out the social media page designs from designs, uh, 99designs.com. Uh, social media page design. We're looking at it right now. You get a great, great sense of, oh, wow, people put together some really cool stuff. It seems like they put a lot of work and effort into it. So that's that's something to think about, too. If you say, well, you know, I don't need new business cards, but I sure would like all my social media pages to have some really cool uniform branding uh, for, for my landing pages, for my profile pages. You can start your next graphic design project for as low as $199 as well. Just go to 99 designs.com so that's 99designs.com slash social hour and you'll get a $99 power pack of services completely free that's quite a gift $99 worth of gifts a power pack gives you more designer time you get more attention that way so you feel very VIP very special 99 designs will highlight your design so that you actually get twice as many designs because you're kind of like a featured person very important person who needs help in that 99 designs marketplace and uh, you you'll be you'll be really happy with all of the designs that come out of the great minds of the folks working over at 99 designs Again, 99designs.com slash social hour. Get that, get that power pack of services for free. You it's a it's a it's a $99 value for free. And we thank 99 Designs for their support of the social hour. All right, we are coming down to the last part of each. Oh, my goodness. Thank you very much. Apparently. The, uh, celebrating the palindrome episode. <gasps> oh, Thanks to Third Street. Like well, thank Look, I'm 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 drinking a beautiful. This smells like an IPA. What did you? What is this? Oh, yummy! Out of Tom oh, Merritt's uh, Tech News Today glass. I don't know if you can see this. Hello. I don't know where this came from. Thank you, Liz. Aren't you sweet? So here's the. Uh, cheers to uh, episode 121. Palindromes. Palindromes. Woo! Thank you, Liz. <laughs> this is perfect. All right, now now I'm feeling very festive. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Radder fad. Who's ready? Okay, so for this Radder fad. 
uh, this is, uh, you're either going to love this idea or you're going to hate the idea of social media stars mm -hmm. on reality shows. Right. So I looked at this story and there's a casting call though. They want to bring a bunch of these people together. And yeah, that's right. That the, what's going on here? They're in, they're, the, the idea is in its infancy. They are, they are now trying to find the kind of social media stars who would be great on a reality show. And they want to put these people together. They and want then to put these people them, together. And then see the, the fun things that happen to social media stars. Isn't it just going to be a bunch of... When people stop being polite. Well, isn't it just going to... If they're social media stars, that means they're on social networks all the time, right? So which means that if I'm talking, right. I'm having an argument with you because we're in the social media house. Yeah. Isn't a lot of the show going to be like this? I don't know. That's a good question. Because I mean, you're constantly I... doing, unless they're doing voice dictation, like, okay, I'll hit voice dictation and be like, Sarah Lane is really irritating me right now. I'm really sick of being in the social media house. <laughs> and then I have to check. It's like, no, hang on, hang on. There it is. Oh, good. There it is. Well, like, hold on a second. But, but you're saying basically if you're somebody who's really popular on social media, then that means you're not doing a lot of talking out loud? Well, you have to be interactive with your audience, right? Well, and What about I spoilers? Suppose. How are you going to work that out? Like if I'm a really popular on Twitter and I'm like having a fight with somebody on in that actual but house. But if it's a, well, well, they didn't say that it's going to be a reality show that's not in real time. Oh, okay. Maybe it's some sort of reality show that's playing out much like you might say Twit itself is a reality show. That's the way that that replayed Twitter thing will actually make sense. Yeah. Because you'll see the housemates angrily writing about each other or mm -hmm. secretly they're confessionals or whatever they'll do. Yeah. I just don't... I'm just kind of curious if it'll work. I, I don't think I'd watch it. You'd watch this? I don't like reality shows in what? general. I used They're to. They're all the same. Well, yeah, I know. I used to, and I mean, there are certain like Real Housewives that I kind of say like, ha ha, yeah, I watch that at the gym. I do sometimes, but hey, if I'm running, I get to watch whatever I want. And the worse, the better. But in general, yeah, there are way too many reality shows. They're very formulaic. I'm sick of it. But I don't necessarily think it's the worst idea in the world to take social media stars to reality shows for the kind of people who want to produce this kind of programming. Because these are people who, you know, they're, they're, they know how to leverage their personality. You know, a lot of social media stars are really, really successful because they're entertaining, but also because they know how to work the system. They know how to get a lot of page views. They know how to get a lot of... You know, they know how to get people riled up. They know how to, you're, you're laughing, but you I'm know what I mean. I'm laughing because I'm thinking too small. I'm like, wait a minute, social media stars. I'm thinking humans. Why not Lil Bub and Boo? These are social media stars. Put them in a house together. People would watch that because clearly they're not the ones tweeting or writing on Facebook. I don't know that you could say that. Or Grumpy Cat. You put them all together. I mean, clearly people will watch this uh, because I don't know what, there's nothing else on TV? Yeah. I don't know. They've got they've got like a little checklist here. They say if you you know if you're interested, you want to be part of this reality show, you need to have a personality, social media fan base. They don't say like minimum number of followers, although that wouldn't even matter because people can buy followers They'll these check days. Your cloud score. Yeah, what kind of personal brand are you putting out there? Diversity. I guess they just want a diverse type of bunch of people and cats and animals. Good resumes. Ooh. You all gotta be comfortable in front of the camera. Now that's a little different. Now that turns into like YouTube people might be comfortable in front of the camera. But some of the best Twitter accounts aren't necessarily people who do any type of public speaking at all. So there's that. Uh, and then number eight is I try not to bring on divas with an apostrophe S. I don't know. Divas what? Yeah, with their yeah. shoes. What belongs to the divas? Yeah, that's my exactly. curiosity there. And yeah, we're, we're going on about the Possessive use of the apostrophe there. Well, how terrible. Because we're better than that. Yeah. So the question is, Sarah. Yeah. Are you going to nope. submit? No. Should nope. people should do they submit you into this? Nope. 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 I think that Twit the Twit Network is its own sort of brand of reality show mm -hmm. because we spend so much time being ourselves. I you That's and I doing? you and I are not two different people right now. We are hosting a social hour as ourselves. Pretty much it. I mean, we're trying to be interesting for all of you. But there is no part of me that feels like I'm acting. This is a reality show. This is pretty much it. So this is, this, this is, this is, is exactly and, and I'm, I'm like. thrilled to be able to drink beer and get paid for it. So I have already won. <laughs> so My this, reality show is is so a success. This is a rat or fat segment. So we're supposed to say if it's oh, rat right, or fat, right? Oh right, yeah. Mm -hmm. What okay. do you think this is? Social social media stars on reality shows. I think this is a rat idea or just one <laughs> one of those fads. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go opposite of what I'm thinking. I'm going to say it's absolutely 
mad because we need to see these people uh, become famous more so than they already are. And they definitely, they, their egos will not inflate at all if they're on television. I think this is a great idea. You do? Uh huh. Oh, Aya says red. I have to say, I kind of want to see. A, there you go. Oh, yeah. You kind of got a little pencil head. Pencil neck? Yeah, I got a yeah. my, uh, pencil neck geek. Sorry, there we That's go. That's right. Oh, there. Oh, I've got looking a good. Head. Yeah, just you got a. my tie. Oh. There we go. Pretty close. Mm -hmm. You got nice broad shoulders. Looking Thank you. good. Thank you. That's, this eer is how I get that's dressed eerily every day. accurate. Except for my hands. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Your hands it's are. Like, hmm. Got to get your hands out in the sun. <laughs> that's much better. Yeah. They're usually just they're on computer keyboards constantly. That's the problem. Uh, Brian, get to work. Fat. I think I'm going to say red also. I think that there there are a few, you know, I Justine, for example. Like mm -hmm. she's a great example of somebody who's she's she's out there. So many people on social networking. I mean, you're hard pressed not to know who I Justine is. She's funny. She's really pretty. It's like I think there would be a lot of people who'd be like, I wanna watch her on a reality show. Like I think she'd be like a fun character to interact with other people. And then maybe you'd have the diva, and then maybe you'd have the grump, and then you'd you know. You get, a, you get a Leo Laporte in there, and then all hell breaks loose. I just, I, I think it's kind of a rad idea. It's like I have help outs. Got it. Then again, they had that Bravo reality show about startups in Silicon Valley, and that didn't really go very well. It's not really about business. This that is was not kind about of a reality show. This too. is more about being yeah, a personality. Yeah, personality. Personality. Jinx. Let's see it, and we'll see if the, you know, if it's a terrible show, and then we'll both claim that we said, ah, it was just a passing fad. Episode 121. We didn't say rad, but for now, we'll say rad. All right, good. Two rads. It's been a success. We've been on kind of a roll. Amber has brought some uh, some pretty rad ideas to the show. Speaking of the show, this episode is over. That is it for this episode of the Social Hour Palindrome, episode 121. Aya's actor, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to uh, to suffer through this. This was hardly this suffering. Hour. Well, this it was, was fun. It was a little bit more than an hour. I know I said, all you have to do is sit with me That's for an hour and talk about up. stuff. It's interesting stuff. It's interesting stuff, I agree. Um, tell people what else you're up to these days. These days, let's see. Hmm. Yeah. I, I'm Hopes moving and furniture dreams. around. Hopes and dreams, yeah, yeah, and long walks on the beach. Yeah, uh, yeah. Learning to swim so I can do that. Otherwise, I'll just be taken out to sea. That'd be a problem. Do, are, you, are you really learning to swim? I'm going to. Do you, you not know how to swim? That's correct. Ah, I don't know how to that, swim. That's I, I, You're not the only friend I have if who you, doesn't know how to swim. If you don't care about me swimming it's, or it's, not. It's a, it's a skill that could be helpful. I'm sure I'll be writing about it on Twitter. Life or death skill. It'll be, you know, if you follow at Ayaz on Twitter, you'll, you'll see my, my attempts to swim. Or you won't see them. You'll read them. Uh, but if you want to know about techs, like tech works and like how to do tech projects, I do a show called Know How. Uh, and, and it's a help and how-to program. Uh, just last week, we did something called Own Cloud, which is kind of like setting up your own Dropbox on your own server pretty much anywhere on the web. So if somebody's trying to attack, attack Dropbox, they're not going to hit your actual install. Uh, lots of fun projects. And I say this on the program, if I can do these tech projects, you can do them. Because I'll tell you, I struggle with some of them. And whatever problems I have, I tell you about the troubleshooting. So you figure all that stuff out because I've been through the pain already. Excellent. That is Know How, twit.tv slash KH. And uh, they actually shoot Know How Live on Thursdays right after iPad Today for anybody who uh, who likes to watch the shows in succession in the reality show format. Uh, remember, for this show, uh, uh, The Social Hour, we are live on Fridays, 4 p.m. Pacific. Sorry, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. Our website is twit.tv slash TSH for The Social Hour. You can find our show on iTunes or all over the web. Amber will be back next Friday. Uh, until then, I'm Sarah Lane. Thanks to Ayaz Akhtar for filling in, and we will see you next week on The Social Hour.